Good afternoon, church. I invite you to stand to honor the word of the Lord. Today's scripture is taken from Genesis 18, verse uh, 27 to 33. Let us all read together on the count of three. One, two, three. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. Again he spoke to him and said, Suppose forty are found there. He answered, For the sake of forty, I will not do it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose thirty are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find thirty there. He said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. He answered, For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again but this once. Suppose ten are found there. He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Church, this is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. You all may be seated. I miss you guys. I uh, wasn't here last week. I was in Indonesia uh, ministering like crazy. I think that's the most packed ministry I've ever done in a single week. But throughout all, um, I really, really pray for you guys and miss you guys. And I believe that you guys have a great time last week, Pastor Sam. Amen? Amen? Let me start with a question. How many shrewd hagglers do we have in this place? Raise your hand high and proud. Hagglers, the one good negotiator, good bargainers. Can I see your hand? All right, a couple of you. Uh, let me make a confession. I am extremely terrible at haggling. If I want to buy an item at a street market and I ask the seller, how much is it? And the seller say 50 bucks, I say, how about 40? And the seller reply, no, I can't sell for 40. And I say, how about 45? And the other person said, 50 is the best price already. But okay, Allah, for you, I give 45. But don't tell anyone, okay? I make no profit, you know, this is special price just for you, okay? And I walk away thinking, I got a good deal. But let me tell you the best haggler I know, my mom. <laughs> if the price of an item is 50 bucks, her opening price is not 40, it's not 30, it's five bucks. And she most likely walk away with the item for 10 bucks. I'm kidding, okay? There's one true story, true story. Uh, there's one time, I wasn't there, but I heard the story. During the trip to Israel, when some of the people were happy to get a shirt for 10 bucks, they thought they had a good deal. Till my mom went to the same place and got three shirts for 10 bucks. <laughs> Sometimes when I listen to her haggling for a price, I'm like, who is this lady? I'm not with her. I don't know her, right? Why am I telling you this story? Because when we read this passage, it feels like Abraham is haggling with God, right? And I'm puzzled at this story for many years because God is the God of heaven and earth. I mean, He owns the universe. He knows everything. He's absolutely sovereign. We know that. He knows the end from the beginning. And if that's true, how can anyone haggle with God? How can anyone bargain with someone who already predetermined everything from the beginning? Is that even possible, right? And can we do what Abraham did? So that's what I want to talk about tonight. So for the past few sermons on our series, Life by the Power of Prayer, for the two part of the series, we talk about Jesus' teaching on how to pray. Remember that? And then we talk about the art of asking. And those two sermons actually give us a framework of prayer. But starting this week and for the coming weeks, we will go back and look at the, the stories from the Old Testament of people who prayed and actually apply the framework that we learn in the way they pray. And our story for today is the very first recorded conversation in which a human being goes before God with petition. In other words, this is a prayer. 
And so this strange text about Abraham haggling with God actually teaches us about prayer and how prayer works. So let me give you the context first. The story goes like this. So what happened before this was God, God took on human form and he visited Abraham and Sarah with two angels. So they had a meal together and then God told Abraham, by this time next year, your wife shall have a son. And when Sarah heard it, she giggled, right? Me having a son? I'm 90 years old and my husband is 99. It ain't going to happen. The machine stopped working already. And God said, Sarah, why did you laugh? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And Sarah like, I did not love. And God like, no, you did. End of story. The point is, God knows everything. He, we can't lie to God. So after this conversation with Abraham and Sarah, God and the two angels get up to leave, and Abraham went with them. And then there's another conversation between God and Abraham, and that's what our passage is all about, okay? So I have three points for my sermon, the invitation, the response, and the conversation. And I will give you three quick applications at the end of it. Let's look at the first one, the invitation for 16 to 21. Then the man set out from there, and they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nation of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. This is remarkable. Because this text shows us the privileged position that Abraham has in front of God. So as God about to leave, God says out loud, Hmm... Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Because the text tells us that God is actually on his way to judge Sodom and Gomorrah for their wickedness. Now think about it. We never say out loud, hmm, I don't know if I should tell you about this unless we want to. Am I right? So if you say to me, hmm, yes, I don't know if I should tell you about this or not, I'm going to say, about what? Tell me. And then you're going to tell me about it. So you don't say out loud, shall I tell you about this, unless you have already pre-decided that you're going to tell about the other person about it. Am I right? So why does God say it loud? Here's why. Because God is inviting Abraham to converse with him. And Abraham's prayer is a response to God's invitation. In other words, it is God's word that initiates Abraham's prayer. And that's what prayer is, my friend. What's prayer? See, prayer does not start with us talking to God. It starts with God speaking to us through his word. It is less about our initiative and more about God's invitation. It does not begin with us. Prayer begins with God. So now the question is, why would God want Abraham to know what he would do to Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, two reasons that God gave us in these previous verses. First, it's because Abraham will come a great nation, and through him all the nation of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham should know what's going to happen to one of these nations, to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, specifically because these two nations are going to experience the wrath of God's justice not the blessing that might come to Abraham. So Abraham, as the father of great nations, should know what's going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the first reason. The second reason is Abraham meant to pass on to his children and his household the lessons of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know what lesson that is? The same lesson that we're teaching our Sunday school kids today, right? What's that lesson? Kids, you don't want to be like people of Sodom and Gomorrah. They were so wicked that God had to send fire, hail, and brimstone to destroy them. So this is a lesson of what can happen if people forsake God and pursue wickedness. This is God's warning of God's judgment on sin. With another word, God is saying, do you want to know what I will do to wicked city? 
look at Sodom and Gomorrah. But when we think about Sodom and Gomorrah, I think our minds immediately think about what? Sexual sin, isn't it? We even have a word for it, Sodomy. If you don't know what that word means, don't Google it. These cities are indeed famous for their sexual sins. But it's not just that. Because the word outcry in verse 20 is a Hebrew word that is throughout the Bible to indicate the cries of the oppressed, the victims of cruelty, violence, and injustice. So God says the outcry of the people who are being violated, who are crushed, who are victims of injustice, violence, and cruelty is so great that I must go down to see for myself if this means judgment. Now, do you realize anything weird about that? kind of weird if we think about it. Why? Because God knows everything, right? God hears everything. He sees everything from His throne. He does not have bad eyesight. I know God is old, but He has perfect eyesight. So why does God need to go down Himself and investigate the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah? Unless He has special reason to do that. And I'm convinced He does. What God does, He's inviting Abraham to do something about it. So that's why God speaks out loud. Hmm, I don't know, Abraham, if I should tell you about this or not. It is an invitation for Abraham then to ask God, what is it, God? To have discussion with God. Because although God says this city is so evil and I'm going to judge them at the same time, God invites Abraham to step forward and intervene. Now let's hit a pause button here. Because this story tells us God is not ignorant of any evil. He knows and He invites Abraham to do something about it. And in the same way, church, God is inviting us to do something about the evil, the wickedness that we see all around us. I mean, I love the city of Sydney, okay? I know some of you are like, Melbourne? No, Sydney. But I also know that the city of Sydney has a lot of wickedness in the city. We might be unaware of most of them. But not one wrong has ever gone unnoticed by God. Not one sin has ever failed to cry out to God because He's aware of the social and moral corruption in the city, which means He hears the cry of a child being abused by a drunken father. He hears the cry of an old man beaten on the street. He hears the cry of a young girl being raped in an abandoned place. He hears the tears of abandoned spouse. He hears the cry of people being unjustly accused and put in prison. And because God knows and hears all, we can be sure that God will not remain idle. Judgment is coming. Now at this point, some of you might say, Judgment? What do you mean by that? I mean, that's so primitive, yours. I don't believe in judging God. I believe in loving God. Do you know what's the problem with that? We cannot have a loving God who is not a judging God. You understand this? When you love something, you hate the thing that destroyed the thing you love. When you love your spouse, you hate anyone that might come threaten the relationship between you and your spouse. For example, when I was diagnosed with leukemia in 2009, like my parents loved me. And because they love me, they hate the cancer that threatens my body. Do you know what they do? They were willing to use the violent chemotherapy on my body to why? To fight the cancer and to remove the cancer from me. See, that's why we can't pit being loving and judging against each other. Because if we have a loving God who hears the cry of the oppressed and He won't judge, let me tell you, that God is not loving. That God does not care. A God who never judges is not a loving God. But God's love, like all true love, includes wrath, anger. Wrath toward the things that destroy what He loves. So this is a problem, right? So here's, here comes the problem of the text. The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and God came down to judge them. But at the same time, God said, you know what, Abraham, I'm inviting you to intervene. 
And in the same way, God is inviting us to intervene in the brokenness we see around us. You with me so far? So that is the context of the story. But what's magnificent is what comes next, Abraham's response. Verse 22 to 25. So the man turned from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous way in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Let me tell you, this is remarkable. Because after Abraham heard what got his mind for Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham drew near to God. And Robert Adler, a Jewish Hebrew expert, said that the word draw near is actually a technical term that means to approach the bench. It's a legal term. It means to come with a case. So God is inviting Abraham to intervene on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah as their legal representative. And Abraham responded. This is prayer. And pay attention to the two things that Abraham does in his prayer. First, pay attention for whom Abraham is making the case. Abraham is making a case, is interceding for what? For a wicked city. Well, some might argue, well, yours. It's because Abraham's nephew, Lot, and his family are in the city of Sodom. And that is why Abraham interceded for Sodom. Well, yeah. Lot and his family are in the city of Sodom. But if you read the way Abraham intercedes, Abraham is interceding not just for Lot. If he's just interceding for Lot, he will have said, God, I agree with you that the city of Sodom is wicked. But my nephew and his family are in the city. God is zealous for God's honor. He has no doubt that God cannot and will not do wrong. God is always fair in his judgment. God won't be clouded what, by what the netizen says on social media. So Abraham's starting point is God and God's character. And then he move on. And he asked this profound, profound question. He asked this question. God, will you destroy the city and not spare the city for 50 righteous people who are in it? In other words, this is what Abraham is asking. And it's a profound question. Here's the question. Will God not forgive the unrighteous many for the sake of the righteous few? This is outstanding. This is very different from the culture that we live in today. We live in a culture, what they say, cancel culture. Have you heard that term before? What is cancel culture? It means it is very easy for people to write other people off. Like I or we may have not personally done anything wrong, but if we're connected to the wrong person, then we too should be shamed, cut off, and punished. For example, let's say your dad is a corrupter, and he is put in prison because of that. His corruption has nothing to do with you, to do with you right? But our culture say, because your dad is a corrupter, you're not qualified to run for government office. So we live in a world that loves to take down as many people as possible for the sins of the few. But Abraham is asking the opposite. Note, Abraham is not asking God to neglect his justice. Oh, no, no, no. He knows God is the God of justice. He knows the supreme judge of all the earth must do what is right. But what Abraham is asking is, if it's possible for God to forgive the sins of many people with the righteousness of few people. Is it possible for God to value the righteousness of the few so much that it covers the unrighteousness of many? Can God forgive the whole city for the sake of a few righteous people in the city? Let me put it in a very personal, simple form for our context. We know God is righteous. We know God is holy. We know God is just, and because of that, God must punish every wrongdoing. The question is, is our record 
all we have to go on. Is our record the ultimate determining point of our destiny? Or is it possible that the righteousness of someone else could cover us and save us? Is it possible for someone else's record to be imputed to us? Is it possible for the righteous God to count the righteousness of the deserving to the undeserving? Is that possible? You know why this is a remarkable prayer? You see what Abraham is asking? Is it possible, God? And look at what happened next. The conversation between God and Abraham. Verse 26 to 33. And the Lord said, Well, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy if I find forty-five there. Again he spoke to him and said, Suppose forty are found there. He answered, For the sake of forty, I will not do it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, For the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again about this one. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, For the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way, when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. What a conversation, right? I don't know about you, but really when I read this passage, it feels, this conversation feels like watching people hanging for a price in a street market. So Abraham over got a price, and God said yes. But every time God said yes, Abraham said, actually, uh, that's not enough, I want more. It's like me selling my car for 25K. You come up to me and say, hey, Yos, I'm a church member. Would you take 10K for it? And I say, since you're a member of my church, I'll gladly sell my car to you for 10K. By the way, this is just illustration. Do not come up to me and ask me if you can buy my car for 10K. Then you follow up and say, well, since you seem very generous to your church member, how about 5K? Sure, 5K sounds great to me. What about 1K? Sure, I'll sell my car for 1K to you. And you say, why don't you pay for the car registration and third party insurance and I'll take your car for free. And I say, you're a leech, ungrateful church member. This is what happened in the story. But this story is not simply a story of bargaining with God. Because I want you to pay attention to the way Abraham confers with God. First, notice Abraham's humility. In his conversation with God, Abraham knew, never lost the sight of the gulf between him and God. So when, God, when Abraham asked God if God can spare Sodom for the sake of 50 righteous people in the city, God said, yes, I will spare the city of Sodom for the sake of 50 righteous people in the city. And this tells us a groundbreaking truth in the Old Testament. Because Abraham just learned something deeply profound, something never heard of before. And what is that? Here's the theological truth. The righteousness of someone else could save an unrighteous person. This is unheard of. It's almost like Abraham finally discovered a path to a seemingly impregnable mountain, the mountain of God's justice. Because the truth is, if God, the supreme judge of all the earth, does what is just, there is no hope for humanity. All of us are sinful. And God's justice demands us to be punished for our sin. And one of the most common questions that I receive is this. Well, yes. Why do bad things happen to good people? It's a fair question. And I can understand why people ask that question. And I understand why it's a struggle for many. But let me rephrase the question. Because the Bible never asked that question. Instead, the Bible won't ask, won't ask to us, why do good things happen to anyone? Why do good things happen to bad people? Because let's face it, if God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, they do not get worse than they deserve. 
they get exactly what they deserve. They are wicked, evil city. So now Abraham is encouraged by God's answer, right? And he continues, God, I know I am but dust and ashes, but let me dare myself to ask you once again. So Abraham acknowledged that he's but dust and ashes before God. And as the conversation continues, Abraham keeps saying, God, please don't get mad at me. Please don't be angry. But let me ask you one more time. And God, please. Now, can you see Abraham's humility in the way he converses with God? Abraham does not treat God like a genie in a lamb who exists to fulfill his wishes. He understands he's talking to the supreme judge of all the earth, the maker of heaven and earth. He understands his position. He has no right to command God on what to do. And this is important in our prayer. See, when we pray, we must remember to whom we're talking to. We're talking to the sovereign God of the universe. Yes, he's our father, but he's sovereign God of the universe. One of my pet peeves is when I heard people pray in God, to God in public. You know, I don't know if you have friends like this. Dear Daddy in heaven, how are you today? You know, I get it. You know, I, know, I understand that God is our loving Father, but I don't know. It's just my heart cringes whenever I hear that. Because yes, God is our Father, but I hope we never lose sight of the fact that He is the Almighty God. At the same time, I also cringe whenever people say, I declare, I command. Hold a second, God is not your servant. He's the sovereign God of the universe. What right do you have to command God what to do? So God, I mean, Abraham is very humble in the way he approached God. But the second thing that when you notice, it's not only he's humble, he's bold. He's haggling with God. He does not play safe at all. I mean, I don't know. We don't know how many people are there in the city of Sodom. But Abraham begins with 50, right? 50 righteous people in the city. And God said, yes, I will save Sodom for the sake of 50. And then Abraham say, what about 45? God say, yes, I will save Sodom for the sake of 45. Then Abraham goes, what about 40? What about 30? What about 20? What about 10? And God keeps saying, yes. Abraham is persistent. He asked God six times, and he kept asking for more. Can you see how his boldness grew as he kept asking and God kept saying yes? Because he starts with asking five less than the original number, and then it increases to ten. Can you see what happened? Abraham does not pray for safe things from God. He does not ask God for easy things to do. He knows he has no right to ask God what he has, but he risks his life asking God anyway. Because why? Because Abraham knows God's heart. He knows that God will show mercy if there is anyone who deserves it. Such is the heart of God. That's why Abraham's prayer is bold. So that means, on one hand, Abraham is far more scared of the majesty of God, and that is why his prayer is humble. On the other hand, Abraham is much more confident of God's desire to bless, and that is why his prayer is bold. But here's the question that we must ask the text. I'm pretty sure some of you think about it already. Why stop at 10? I mean, he's doing so well, right? From 50, 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. Why stop? It's like an unfinished symphony. It's like you're playing on a scale. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, 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 ti. You're like, stop with the T, give me the final dough, am I right? You want that final dough to come. So the question of the text is, Abraham, why stop at 10? Why don't you take one more step? Why don't you ask God, God, will you spare the city for the sake of one righteous person? Will the righteousness of one be able to cover the unrighteousness of many? Is that possible? And we expect God to say, yes, Abraham, I will save the city for the sake of one righteous person. But Abraham never asked the question, and God never gave the answer. 
then God judges the city, and the city of Sodom is destroyed. So why? Why Abraham never asked the question, his wife? Abraham knows intuitively there's not one truly righteous person in the city. There's not a single righteous person on the face of the earth, not even him. So let's put it together. So now Abraham has discovered a profound theological lesson, and that is the righteousness of someone else could save an unrighteous person. So Abraham discovered a path through the mountain of God's justice. The problem is Abraham can't walk that path. No one can. Because only a truly righteous person can walk that path. In other words, God is saying, yes, I will save the unrighteousness of many for the sake of the righteousness of one, as long as it is the right one. But there is no right one. And Abraham goes home. But many centuries later, someone came. Someone who can walk that path came to us. His name is Jesus Christ. See, Abraham discovered the profound theological lesson, but Jesus executed the profound theological lesson. Because just like Abraham, Jesus prayed for the wicked people. As they were killing him, on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. If Abraham risked his life for his enemy, Jesus gave his life for his enemies. Abraham prayed, God, please don't get mad at me. Let me ask one more time. But Jesus took God's anger that we deserve so that God is no longer mad at us. Jesus lived the perfect life that we could not. He lived the perfect righteous life. And he walked that path through the mountain and God's justice and paid the penalty of sin. And because of Jesus, today, you and I, we can finish the symphony. We can ask God, God, will you save the unrighteousness many for the sake of one righteous? And God's answer says, yes, if it is Jesus. And the good news of the gospel is, yes, Jesus has come. And when we believe in Jesus, our sins are paid for at the cross, and Jesus' righteousness become ours, so that we are spared for the sake of Jesus. And not only that, but then Jesus continued to do what Abraham does. In Hebrews 7, 25, he says this, Consequently, He's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lived to make intercession for them. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, because it tells us that Jesus' work is not only something that's done in the past, but it is something that he does right now, at this very second. I believe you listened about this, you heard about this last week from Pastor Sam's sermon. At this very second, Jesus is praying, interceding for you and me in front of God. He's praying for us day by day, second by second, which means, listen, that means the cross of Jesus purchased the forgiveness of our sin, but the intercession of Jesus, or Jesus praying for us, applied the forgiveness moment by moment, which means in Jesus, we are continuously forgiven. See, right now, our Savior is not idle. Right now, Jesus is presenting our case before God as a lawyer, as a mediator. You know why this is important? Because even though we have put our faith in Jesus, today we continue to mess up, don't we? We continue to make mistakes again and again. We continue to sin. None of us is free from sin. And oftentimes, if we can be honest with ourselves, it feels like it's only a matter of time before God is tired of us. It's only a matter of time before we are finally removed them from the family card. It's just a matter of time before God finally says, I have enough of you. But the gospel tells us, Jesus constantly argues our case before God. So Jesus does not forgive us through his work on the cross and then hope we can make it on our own. But he continues to pray on our behalf as we continue to fail and sin. And let me tell you the good news of the gospel. Jesus never loses his case. Now, 
I've told you this already, but one of my favorite drama is actually legal drama. Okay, I'm a big fan of Korean legal drama. And I've watched enough to know that if you are put on trial, you are only as, as good as your lawyer. If you're innocent, but you have bad lawyer to represent you, you will lose your case. But if you're guilty, but you have a really, really good lawyer, there's a high chance that you might win your case. Because a good lawyer knows how to win and manipulate the outcome at whatever cost. But let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus is not a good lawyer. Jesus is the greatest lawyer ever. And he's not playing tricks. Because Jesus intercedes on our behalf with an invaluable case. He says to God, the Supreme Judge, Father, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Your justice demand payment for every sin. But I fear all. I have died, and because of that, Father, spare them. Have mercy on them. Love them, not despite your justice, but because of your justice. Because it will be unjust for you to demand two payment for the same sin. And Father, I have paid for it. Now spare them, love them, because of what I've done. Let me tell you, that's invaluable case. God hates sin, but it's just. And he cannot demand two payment for the same sin. And now because of Jesus, we are declared righteous before God, and we are continuously forgiven moment by moment. We are always welcome into God's presence because Jesus always lived to intercede for us. That's the gospel. And if we get this, it changes the way we think about prayer, okay? There are three applications, and I'm done. The first thing, if we understand this, that means we can have a vibrant prayer life. Because if we understand the gospel, then we know that now we can have intimate personal relationship with God. Think about it. The Bible tells us that we are so wicked that Jesus has to die for us. It means that we are awful sinners. It humbles us. But the Bible also tells us that we are so loved that Jesus is glad to die for us. It means we are dearly loved. It emboldens us. Who we are? We are love sinners. Now we need both. Because if we just believe that we are sinners, we won't draw near to God. We hide from God. We are ashamed. We won't come to Him and pray. We are afraid of God. But if we just believe that God is love, but we do not know about His justice and what Jesus has done for us at the cross, that love is superficial. Well, that love does not melt our heart. It does not electrify us. It means nothing. Empty. But if we understand the gospel, if we see how awful sinners we are and how much God has loved us in Christ, that's beauty. That captivates our heart. It makes us want to draw near to God. And that's what gives us a vibrant prayer life. The gospel gives us a relationship with God that Abraham had. Not only that, but second thing, if we understand the gospel, we can have compassion for the people around us. Because when we get the gospel, we understand that we are no better than other people. We can't think that we are superior. We are awful sinners saved by grace. And that same grace that saved us can also save people around us. And I am fully convinced that God has placed us in our family, in our community, in our university, in our workplace, so that we could be Abraham for them. See, God put us there because God wants us to ask for His blessing and mercy for the place where He puts us. We are where we are not by accident. We are where we are because God designed us to be there. David Platt put it this way. Every safe person on this side of heaven owes the gospel to every unsafe person this side of hell. Those of us who have been saved by the gospel are to be carriers of the gospel to those who have never heard the gospel. 
Because now if you understand the gospel, there's no reason for you to think that you are better than evil people out there. We are as wicked as they are. And the reason that we are saved is because God's been merciful to us. That means now, I don't have to think that I'm better. Now, I have the freedom to walk to them and be myself and talk to them and point them to the one that can save me, to the one that can save them. So my question is, when is the last time we pray for the unsafe people around us to come to know Jesus? And the third and the last one, we can ask God, for big things. Look at Abraham. He kept coming, back, kept coming back to God saying, God, I want more. I know you said 40, but I want 45. I know you said 45, but I want 40, and so on. Abraham did not give up and continue to ask God shamelessly, persistently, and trustfully. But some of you, I know you're critical, right? Some of you might ask, but yours, Abraham did not get what he asked for. God still destroyed Sodom. So Abraham's prayer is not answered, right? Yes and no. Yes, Sodom was destroyed. But Lot and his family were safe. Do you know why? Because the Bible tells us God remembered Abraham. Abraham prayer works. Now listen. We never know what we are going to get when we ask. But one thing for sure. We will never get anything if we do not ask. Let me repeat that. We never know what we are going to get when we ask. But one thing for sure. We will never get anything if we do not ask. I know. The next question that you have in mind is, does that mean I can change God's mind? For that, you have to come next week. Does prayer change God's mind? But for today, here's a takeaway. Ask God for big things. Go bold. Be like Abraham. Appeal to God based on who God is because it shows that we are love sinners. It shows that we know that God has all the power and authority in the universe, but we also know that He has all the love in the universe. And God loves it when we ask big things because it shows that we understand who God is and who we are because of Jesus' perfect sacrifice. The question is, what stops you from asking God for big things? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that through this wonderful conversation that you had with Abraham, we can learn about your heart. We can learn how merciful you are, how willing you are to forgive. Even toward the city, a wicked city, you want Abraham to intervene. And God, for the many times again and again that we forgot your generosity, we forgot your heart towards your people. Forgive us, Lord. But I pray today as we learn about this story, how prayer works, I pray that we accept your invitation. It is you who invited us to come and ask. It is you who invited us to intervene on the situation that we experience right now, on the wickedness around us, for the salvation of our family, for whatever it is that we are struggling with, it is you who invite us to come to you. And that's why we come to you. We appeal to you based on who you are and your character. So I pray that you embolden us, Lord. I pray that as we embrace the goodness of the gospel, it enriches our prayer life. You want us to us. So help us, Lord, to be a community, to be people who dare to ask for big things. Knowing that you're a good Father, sovereign God of the universe, who will not fail to give us what's good for us. And we ask this in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I send to our faith as we sing.